All right. Well, what is that expression? We have saved the best for last. We certainly have done that. Um, my my friend and colleague, uh, Ryan Sothan, is going to be presenting on protecting the good life, the Nebraska scams, and anti-fraud education for the SAFE program in 2021. Ryan is an outreach coordinator with the Nebraska Attorney General's Office. He has statewide responsibility for developing and implementing community-based initiatives for educating Nebraskans in the areas of consumer fraud, elder financial abuse, predatory and illegal business practices, identity theft, and internet safety. As a committed, and I can attest to this, as a committed road warrior in fulfilling an average of 180 calendar engagements per year, his educational outreach services are extended to more than 20,000 Nebraskans annually. Ryan holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and as I said to Scott, go uh, for, the, for the Blue Jays, go Huskers, right? Good, yes. So we will welcome Ryan. Ryan, thank All you. Right. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Nebraska Public Media, as well as our sponsors, and all of you uh, across the state who are tuning in to this final presentation of a, a very robust and informative day. Uh, I've had the good fortune to present to this group before. I believe this is my fourth presentation, possibly my fifth, of our SAFE program, the Scams and Fraud Education, or more specifically, the Senior Anti-Fraud Education Program. I'm fond of saying that everything old is new again, and as such, uh, I'll have something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue for all of you to make this time, this final 45 minutes, uh, I think fast-paced, informative, and worth your while. So with that, I'll begin by saying, and am I not on mic? Oh, no, you're doing fine. We're going to go ahead and just do this for you, right? Advance my slides. Okay. There you are, sir. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate Pardon that. Me. My mistake. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I believe it is a uh, Asian or Far Eastern saying, more curse than blessing, may you live in interesting times. I take it that non-interesting times, according to that tradition, are times of peace, harmony, and interesting times are times of dissension and conflict, strife, even war. I think we would all concede that these have been interesting times. And interesting times have not escaped us at the Capitol. Protests are fairly common, fairly routinely though limited to the Capitol steps or outside the front of the governor's mansion. But a story that I'm often asked to tell occurred from earlier this spring, late spring actually in May. We had a visitor to the rotunda in the Capitol who came in full costume dressed as the Energizer Bunny, uh, complete with uh, outfit, sunglasses, drum. He created quite a commotion, as you can imagine, if you've been in our capital with all of that marble and stone. But he was something of a dumb bunny because the legislature had already adjourned for the year. So with the guidance of our very helpful uh, volunteers at the Capitol, he learned that if he simply veered to his left, he could encounter the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, and the Attorney General in one fell swoop. So I was in the office uh, in that side of the Capitol, and my door is always open. Please come and visit at any time. One of my responsibilities is to welcome all walk-ins, those who come without appointment mm -hmm. and are seeking service uh, in the name of the office. And so hearing the Energizer Bunny banging his drum and heading our way, I quickly got on the telephone speed dialing our security team from uh, the Nebraska State Patrol, had them come down the west side and into my office in a hurry, and I said, we've got to do something. We have to deter this bunny and all of his racket, and I'd like to send a strong message that this type of protest within the Capitol is not to be tolerated. So he said, fine, what should we do? And I said, I don't know, we can't charge only you can, so let's send a strong message. And so the officer said, how about third degree assault? And I said, ooh, that sounds ominous, that sounds good. But I knew that third degree assault is actually more bark than bite, more hat than cattle. It really means to act in a threatening or menacing manner. 
And I said, who is really going to believe that the Attorney General or anyone on his staff was sufficiently threatened, much less menaced by a bunny? <laughs> so I said, instead, and I'm actually quite proud of myself for coming up with this, I think we can get away with this charge. And if you'd like to wager a guess, the few here in the room, we charged and got away with charging the Energizer Bunny with battery. Oh. Now they're rolling in the aisles here. I don't know about the, the rest of you. And many of you are probably wondering, Ryan, how is it that you can open your presentations routinely with such bad jokes? <laughs> and to that, I answer practice. Lots and lots oh of practice. God. But I'm doing so because uh, this is no laughing matter. Uh, we had a fairly heavy uh, second uh, act today from our uh, DA presenter in Mr. Greenwood uh, on elder abuse. I have the lighter end of that topic in terms of uh, the fraud and scam education and the financial uh, exploitation and abuse. And here, rather than a heavy message uh, and ending the day on a bit of a downer, I actually have positive news, good news to share because we are moving, trending significantly in the right direction when it comes to reports of frauds and scams. Here is a popular slide and that I've used it every year that I've presented here at Nebraska Public Media for Elder Justice and it is a measure of fraud complaints by age cohort and you can see that in the broadly def defined uh, category of seniors which I have at 60 and over we are at 33 percent of all complaints versus an average rate of about 15 percent for any of the other age cohorts. But this is a significant improvement over years past when just two years ago reflecting 2018 data in 2019 we were at a high of 39 percent. Mm -hmm. We then improved approximately 5 percent between 2019 and pardon me 2018 and 2019 dipping to 37 percent but then had a substantial move downward in the past year during a time of COVID, believe it or not, uh, to 33%. Overall improvement is trending in the 15 to 16% decreased exposure to fraud and scams. However, that does not uh, erase the fact that within the segment, seniors are the least likely to report. So we still have an underreporting uh, occurrence because our senior population, generally speaking, just under 20%, so it's in the, the mid-19% range here in the state. But we know that the incurred rate of fraud and abuse is about 20 to 24 times greater than the reported rate. So we still have a issue, an issue, of underreporting. And so I want to encourage uh, all seniors to uh, not be embarrassed, to not feel that they are victimized and standing alone, that uh, uh, they're in good company. It happens often to many, and that there are places that they can report. We always encourage reporting to our office, to Adult Protective Services, and to the area agencies on aging, to name but a few. I will say that uh, during the uh, spring, as I was uh, privileged to be on the uh, structured decision-making team for Adult Protective Services that I learned uh, with some surprise that though we have a number of referrals to Adult Protective Services in terms of those cases, especially senior cases that make it to the assessment stage, there is a, a fallout or a shrinkage of cases because of not meeting definition. And if you look at the uh, statutory definition of vulnerable adult, which is section uh, 280, or pardon me, 28, uh, 371, vulnerable adult does not include financial exploitation. So having brought that to the attention of our staff, we do look to address that more definitively, actually bringing clarity to the process in the next legislative session. And I also recognize that it may well be a question of resources as well. So we're going to try to streamline and uh, punch up the referral process in adult protective services. Now, common frauds and scams in Nebraska, everyone likes a top 10. Our top 10, uh, this is where the more things change, the more they remain the same because we basically have a rotation within the top 10, but a consistent 
uh, makeup of the top 10. And in Nebraska, imposter scams reign supreme. During 2020, imposter scams are typically what's occurring by telephone, where someone reaches out to the vulnerable uh, senior, telling them a story, a story too good to be true to or too bad to be believed, and on the basis of that story, with urgency applied, gets them to take some form of immediate action, and that immediate action typically involves some form of payment, a gift card, a vanilla visa, a wire, or some form of, a, again, a other denomination. But failing that one call close, then they gather enough personal information to uh, ultimately perpetrate identity theft. And identity theft is, by a whisker, the second most frequently cited complaint in the state of Nebraska. The two together form a Pareto principle of sorts where 20% of uh, the complaints uh, by title account for about 80% of the complaints in number because we have all of these other uh, complaints in our top 20 list. But I'm really only going to focus briefly in this presentation on the imposter scams and on the identity theft, and then move into other elements of what's new in our senior anti-fraud education program. So imposter scams, and these are just some, but we heard earlier today, and I strongly concur, that government official scams are legion, uh, especially in terms of those government or those scammers presenting themselves as representatives of the Social Security Administration and that there is something wrong uh, in the Social Security account of the senior causing their benefits to be temporarily suspended. We also uh, have seen as a result though of the COVID uh, irregular or fraudulent activity type calls. More and more of us have moved our shopping uh, behaviors to online purchasing rather than in-store brick and mortar purchasing. So it's not at all unusual for scam calls pretending to be from an online retailer such as Amazon. This is the fraud department of Amazon. We are reaching out to you to verify that a recent purchase in the name your amount, but let's say $299 for a laptop computer was recently made. And if this uh, account is yours, and authorized by you, do nothing. We'll simply process uh, the order as submitted for delivery here uh, in the next 48 hours. But if it is not you, please press one. We will connect you with our fraud department. And while you are on the phone, we are going to reverse the charges and deposit those funds safely back into your bank account. In all cases where you did not initiate the telephone call, the best advice that I can give is to not give out the personal information. You do not know who you are talking to. And yes, even post traced Act implementation, which I'll get to later in this presentation, caller ID can still be manipulated. If you need to, uh, if you have reason to worry that your uh, Amazon account might be compromised, hang up the phone making whatever excuse is necessary to disengage, independently verify by reaching out to Amazon directly. You can do so by phone, you can do so by online chat, you can do so by email. And it's not just Amazon. Uh, reports are coming in that uh, impersonations of United Parcel Service for package confirmation on delivery, uh, that your PayPal account has been compromised, or with the popularity of the iPhone, that your Apple ID has been compromised. All of these are calls that you would not initiate. So again, if you didn't initiate the contact, don't give out the information. Then last, I would like to briefly touch on, on romance scams or sweetheart scams as they're known in some circles. I do know that Paul touched on this briefly in his presentation. We have absolutely seen a spike in the romance scams. Uh, society at large plus family and friends are encouraging the seniors to uh, uh, what have you got to lose you don't have to find your your future spouse you just need to find a good friend someone that you can weather the times with by engaging in friendly conversation and you fill out an online profile and you'll find that you get a very fast and enthusiastic response where the uh, uh, paramour my term 
uh, encourages you to leave the confines of the dating website to get out from under their fraud detection um, uh, software as well as to get away from the metering that they have to regulate costs associated uh, with the program. And then they will flatter you and they will entice you with the excitement that they live in their lives, which typically involves foreign travel uh, and the type of travel that you can do together. And you will be progressing uh, steadily with enthusiasm and increasing commitment towards a meeting. But before that meeting occurs, wherever you're destined to meet, you will hear from the scammer with an excuse. And that excuse could pertain to their business, their family, their person, their automobile, but there's a cost associated there with and the funds that they were going to take to come to see you are now going to have to be temporarily reapplied to deal with this short-term emergency. And the senior in that sense of commitment and disappointment because they were so looking forward to uh, the meeting will say, well, hey, we're, we're in this together. Can I possibly help? I know that you'll pay me back. Mm -hmm. Trust me. I'll step in. I'm here for you. And you'll pay the fine or the fee, whatever the expense is, and your paramour will either be coming back to you for more to hit and run and bleed you dry, or you'll never hear from them again. And then the loss is not only the financial loss, it's the emotional loss of what was believed to have been a solid relationship. We are definitely seeing a spike in romance scams and a closely related cousin, this may surprise you, pet scams. If you can't commit to an interpersonal relationship but have plenty of love in your heart, perhaps you have just what's necessary for a new Fido or a new Fluffy to come into your life. And there are websites aplenty catering to the pet desires of a growing population and seniors are prominent within that population. With pet websites, watch out for, know your breed first and foremost, know what your breed goes for. A very popular animal at this time is a French Bulldog. Frenchies, especially pedigreed Frenchies, are easily 2,500 to 5,000. Some range 7,500 to 10,000. One website uh, that I saw was offering Frenchies for $850 right away. That's a story too good to be true. But as you pay the money, also note the form of payment because these pet scam websites do not accept traditional payment. They'll only accept payment by wire or by peer-to-peer -peer payment systems like Zelle, Cash App, or I'm going to forget the other one, uh, Venmo. So a senior is typically not going to understand a peer-to-peer -peer payment plan uh, and is going to be a little bit confused by the inability to accept cash or credit card. Furthermore, there will be excuses made as to why uh, Fido or Fluffy cannot be immediately shipped to you. It might be a shot regimen that is now required due to the COVID or it might be a temperature controlled crate or that uh, it's best that they not travel alone and so we're going to have a pet nanny accompany them and there always are additional step up costs associated. So watch out for pet scams. There is a website named, oddly enough, PetScams.com that you can go to to check out the uh, viability of the pet website. And would you believe it, there are over 23,000 fraudulent pet websites in the United States at this time. You'll note if you find a website that appears to be in Nebraska that it has a non-Nebraska-based telephone number, may not have a Nebraska-based address. Do your research before engaging. Now. Uh, identity theft is the nation's number one consumer complaint and a very close second to imposter scams here in the state of Nebraska. I consider imposter scams often a means to an identity theft end. But identity theft soared during the time of COVID throughout calendar 2020 where it accounted for just under half of all consumer complaints were identity theft in all of its forms. Uh, this was a doubling of the reported rate from uh, the year past, and it was driven largely by a spike in illegitimate government documents and benefits, most frequently measured as fraudulent unemployment insurance claims. If you or a senior that you know, know or represent, pardon me, uh, 
receive a letter from the Nebraska Department of Labor indicating that your uh, unemployment insurance claim has been received, has been reviewed, has been adjusted, has been adjudicated, has been denied, and you're confused, you have a right to be confused. Because um, there is such a spike in unemployment insurance related fraud. That needs to be reported to the Department of Labor and then you need to take the necessary steps to make sure that the stolen identity that was used to take out unemployment insurance in your name has not resulted in broader or more widespread identity theft. I want to say it's not a clerical error if you get that letter and it's not just hearing from the Nebraska Department of Labor. I've personally taken calls from seniors reporting that they have received notices of unemployment insurance benefits filed in their name in Massachusetts, in Montana, in Utah, and in Colorado. Those are just five that I'm aware of. So it is a red flag warning of identity theft active and underway in your life. But in addition to uh, government document and, and benefit fraud, the mainstay of identity theft continues to be for purposes of cash flow. This slide basically represents the previous slide in graphic form. And if I can talk in circles for a minute, if you look at fraud, fraudulently obtained credit cards at 29%, non brick and mortar online only banks where a bank account can be opened fraudulently at 7%. And then the fact that anybody can obtain a home loan, a debt consolidation loan, an auto loan, an auto lease online, fraudulent loans and leases in that arena at 18%, the three circled items together account for 54%, meaning that the dominant driver for a stolen set of credentials is still for purposes of cash flow. So how do we address and how do we stop? One of the great benefits of COVID is that prior to the pandemic hitting, we could, as Americans, access our credit reports for free once annually. A little bit of a misnomer because it's once annually per credit reporting bureau, and there are three major credit reporting bureaus in Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So you could access your credit for free three times a year. Now you can access your credit weekly, and it's important that you do so. But if the senior has received, for example, an unemployment insurance letter indicating that benefits have been applied for in their name, the first thing I would counsel them to do is to access their credit report and see what other potential inquiries for new credit have been uh, taken out in their name. They're logged up front early in the report process. Hopefully they will find none. And if they find none, then the next logical step is to lock the credit report by enabling a security freeze, also widely known as a credit freeze. This is easy to do. It does not necessarily require technology because you can do it by phone. But the charge, charges uh, are non-existent anymore. It has been made entirely free since the Equifax data breach of 2017. And I, I strongly recommend that the default state of the credit report be frozen as opposed to unfrozen as it is for the majority of Americans now. This is one of the simplest and most effective steps you or a senior can take to protect yourself from identity theft. It's free, it's easy. Now here's an emerging scam. I wanted to bring something uh, new to the table. I'm not sure that uh, you all might be as aware of as we in terms of the calls that we were receiving, especially during prime moving months during the summer of moving scams. Uh, this has created a surge in, in, well the pandemic has created a surge in Americans moving across the, the country. Does it involve seniors? Yes. Seniors constitute the largest home ownership rate in America. About 80% of seniors own their home. But as they age, they are finding reasons to 
downsize, move closer to family, move to a retirement home, move to a, a, a second home, whatever, we've got between one in six to one in 10 uh, seniors that are on the move in any given year. And because of the supply chain shortage, which is largely driven by a shortage of containers, of trailers, and of truck drivers, it has moved and impacted the moving industry as well in that the major moving companies are booked well in advance and have their own uh, supply chain issues to deal with. So this might send the senior scurrying to find who can move my possessions to my new home. And they might find a uh, no-name moving company and contact them negotiate uh, a deal, and then find that they're on the distant end awaiting for their uh, possessions to arrive and they never arrive. Or instead of uh, uh, not arriving, it's a delayed arrival, but your possessions are held at ransom. Or that charges are going to be doubled. There have been a number of nightmare stories impacting seniors across Nebraska. So I'd like to share a a red flag checklist for moving scams. If the moving company is willing to give the senior an estimate, sight unseen, that is a major red flag. Or if the moving company will not provide either a binding or a non-binding estimates. Binding estimates, non-binding estimates, but the estimate itself is key to cost control because as you can read, the binding estimate is that you will not pay more than the estimated amount, whereas the non-binding estimate means that there can be fluctuation in the cost of the move, but no more than 10% additional of the uh, original uh, estimate. And if the moving company should require of you a deposit before they're willing to uh, pick up or deliver the goods, I would move on rather than move in with that company. If you go to the moving company's website and they have no local address, no licensing information, including their Department of Transportation number, that is a red flag warning. And all moving companies are required to give consumers a copy of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's booklet, Your Rights and Responsibilities When You Move. This document looks just like this as appearing on your screen. For those of you perhaps in the area agencies on aging where you have ample information for the protection of seniors including materials from our office, this is a free document available from the Federal Carrier Motor Safety uh, Administration that I would recommend having a small supply on for those seniors who are moving. We have also come up with our own data sheet, which is available on our website, and we are in the process now of developing a moving kit, which will perhaps feature the rights and responsibilities when you move, this data sheet, and some other items that we'll then look at proactively marketing to the military, realtors, uh, the moving companies themselves, and associations, including trucking associations. We need to get the word out, again, the pandemic and the supply shortage has created what for all intents and purposes is outright piracy in an industry that heretofore we really didn't have fraud complaints in number coming from. Now, uh, pending legislation, and I know I, I made mention of this on one of our uh, elder uh, justice telephone calls uh, earlier this year, but there is pending legislation in Washington called the Fra Fraud and Scam Reduction Act. It has passed one of the two houses of Congress. It is lost in the House right now as the House is attempting to deal with its uh, major spending and infrastructure bills. But what I like about this is it uh, raises uh, within the Federal Trade Commission the uh, establishment of an office that will um, protect seniors, um, educate employees, uh, allow for a reporting of information that is then broadly uh, distributed to uh, everyone uh, across a number of industries to better educate and inform seniors of their uh, scams. And I think it is um, 
likely to pass. I'm sorry that it hasn't passed as of yet, but it almost uh, brings up to a cabinet-like level within the Federal Trade Commission uh, and makes permanent the uh, segmentation of the group of seniors in terms of their fraud and abuse, which will allow for the trend line, which has been moving in a positive direction, as I said at the outset, to continue. We still have about a 45% improvement to go until we get down to fraud and scam reporting being 19% of all frauds and scam reports in keeping with our population representation. But I do believe that this significant piece of legislation will contribute um, to that ongoing improvement. Now I'd like to segue to stopping unwanted calls because during the course of this year we finally saw broad implementation of another piece of significant uh, legislation and that is known as the TRACED Act or the Telephone Robocall Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act. This occurred uh, at the halfway point of the year, June 30th of 2021. And what it means is that we are automating, if you will, scam call detection and placing it into the network. The networks in terms of the traditional landline, wireless in terms of cell phone, and uh, I'm gonna say cable, which is actually voice over internet protocol or IP telephone networks. It is most significant that it is moving into the voice over internet protocol or IP networks because 99% of the scam calls are originated by scammers not based within the continental United States, but calling from overseas and using the internet as their backbone. It works on the notion of a digital token that is placed on every telephone call at the point of origination. And then as that call is transmitted over the network, it will move from whether you're dialing across town, across country, across the world, You'll go through a number of telephone switches and at each point of transfer, that next switch will be looking for that digital token. And if that digital token is not present, the call is to be denied, or if it is passed, it is to be passed with a warning. The closest example I can make, and I was dipping into my wallet, I'm pulling out a credit card and having to judge where the camera is. All of us had our, our cards replaced in the past approximately five years as this EMV chip came into widespread utilization. EMV is Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, and this chip is the equivalent of a digital token. And what happened? It changed our behavior at points of sale. We no longer, if you can remember the days of the old card zippers where you were asked if you'd like to keep your carbons or have them shred for you, uh, it changed your behavior from that type of card zip or card swipe to now where you insert your card at the point of sale terminal, let go, and then wait for the terminal to chime that your uh, purchase has been authorized and is approved and that you may review, remove your card. This process of the EMV chip rollout began about seven years ago. It took three plus years to reach critical mass in terms of the terminals, the card issuance, and then the consumer knowledge. But in the process, in the past seven years, it has virtually eliminated credit card counterfeiting. Hmm. In the prior years, prior to the transition seven years ago, credit card counterfeiting was the dominant form of identity theft abuse. Where I'm going with this is that this chip, this token, is now applied in the network, metaphorically speaking, not physically, but electronically speaking. And if that token is going to authorize the call, meaning that the call itself can now no longer be spoofed, it can't appear as a local telephone number if it's originating, for example, from overseas. Without that token, the call is to be blocked or denied. That's what I mean by blocking robocalls by default. And then, because of the token, we now, as law enforcement, for the first time ever, have, have now have the ability to trace end-to-end -end a telephone call propagated over an IP network. That is huge, and I'll show you uh, a lawsuit that is ensuing as a direct result of the ability to trace a robocall using this new digital token 
uh, architecture. One of the aspects of the Traced Act is that the telephone companies must provide services to block unwanted calls. They must provide it, they must actively promote it, and they are not to charge you for the basic features of the Traced Act. So you are finding widespread branding and marketing of the brand by the major carriers. Here, for example, is the Traced Act implementation for the nation's largest wireless carrier, which is Verizon. It is known as Call Filter. AT&T is in the act with their product, known as uh, Call Protect. And I'm making a notion here that Call Protect, much like Call Filter, comes in two forms, the free form and the markup form. I want to uh, state strongly that the free form is all that you or the senior needs because it provides everything that the law requires to prevent unwanted robocalls. There is nominal difference or improvement in stepping up to a $3.99 plan as AT&T charges for. And there's more here than I want to get into, but some robocalls are still going to be passed as we continue to build the infrastructure across the legacy networks um, in America. And Nebraska is fraught with old copper wire legacy networks. So if you're getting robocalls, the point of responsibility and accountability has shifted to the carrier. You can instruct your senior to contact their carrier to address the robocalls that are continuing to get through and they may say oh well you need to step up to our call protect plus plan and that's what's happening is that the free plan isn't covering all of your calls baloney the free plan is all that the senior needs and it is for other reasons that some of these scam calls are getting through again it is the legacy networks that are at fault. These are the old copper wire uh, networks that find a very high expense to switch to the all digital technology that is inherent to uh, uh, the new Traced Act implementation. And those legacy networks have been given an additional two years to transition to Traced Act implementation. That doesn't, pardon me, that doesn't take them off the hook though because if they cannot do full traced act implementation they must come up with a robocall mitigation plan and that robocall mitigation plan is how they're going to transition the consumer from now to full traced act implementation so that they can experience the benefits of the traced act implementation measured in reduced exposure to unwanted robocalls. Uh, last of the three major cellular networks, the merged Sprint and T-Mobile has Scam Shield. I actually find personally, having a telephone background in the past, that this is one of the best products that I have seen in terms of the robust feature set. But this actually requires a bit of sophistication on par on the part of the user to understand how to operate a smartphone and so if you're technology adverse though this is I think the bee's knees in terms of a robust feature set to allow you to do everything when it comes to blocking and filtering your unwanted calls if you can't operate a smartphone then you're doomed and I'm actually setting the stage for some slides I have coming up on crossing the digital divide a guide for seniors but let's say you're stuck on a legacy network. These are largely for your landline users. Your landline carriers and even the IP network still offer what is construed as a traditional landline, even if it's VOIP based. They have what's called calling features. Instruct the senior, help the senior by showing them online or calling into the customer service department of the local uh, phone company. And here I'm, I'm talking Spectrum. Spectrum is one of the dominant carriers, not only in Lincoln, but in Grand Island and Carrick and Kearney. Uh, calling features which are enabled through the uh, keypad of the telephone are available. 
They are broad, they are effective. You can see here with call guard, you can block individual uh, calls that may be hounding you. You can also provide feedback and do your reporting right online because again, the carriers are now accountable if robocalls are getting through. It's part of their robocall mitigation plan to give you the ability to complain locally. And then I mentioned the new enforcement capabilities that now that we can trace an IP or internet-based call, here but three weeks ago yesterday is the Attorney General from the state of Indiana noticing that their uh, Consumer Affairs Division was swamped with reports of unwanted robocalls through a CID, which is a subpoena, a civil investigative demand, was able to trace back the robocalls that were coming in and discovered that uh, through a California, uh, well, an Indiana company was acting as a gateway for uh, a foreign-based operation operating out of the countries of India, Singapore, and the Philippines. And a California company was providing the capability for auto dialing to send out not millions of calls, but billions of calls. So three weeks ago, the AG sued. Uh, it will be a $500 fine per call. That should be enough, as this is uh, uh, taken through the court process, to put the offending companies out of business and hopefully have their assets seized. It is a foreshadowing of the type of strong enforcement action that is to come. Now, uh, I'm going to conclude largely where I left off last year. Last year I said it is incumbent on us through programming that we can provide through area agencies on aging and uh, senior centers. We have to help the seniors adopt to technology. We're 21 years, soon 22 years into a new century. And if we really want to do our best at protecting our seniors, we have to say, okay, we'll give and get if you work with us on adopting to the new technology. This, uh, proving my marketing and business background, is uh, an adaptation of an adoption curve. And over on the uh, far right side of the curve at 100%, you can see that the, the world has adopted to but three things, and that is oxygen, food, and water. But over on the right-hand side of the curve, it's only a small percentage of the population, less than 20%, that is adopted to popular technologies such as Amazon, such as uh, Netflix, such as uh, uh, popular uh, email clients like, like Gmail. Then there is a chasm. And so what we're talking about is all of these products that we might take for granted are niche products in the minds of the masses. And the seniors are in the masses that are the late majority to laggards in adopting the technology. We have to help them get over the curve and adopt. And so I promised that I would come up with programming designed to address this need. And I did through a program called Crossing the Digital Divide, a guide for seniors. I piloted, piloted it with the university through Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. It was a success. So much a success that they came back to me through the Rake School and asked me to present again this coming spring. So in March, if you'd like to taste test this Crossing the Digital Divide, a guide for seniors, check out the OLLI schedule. To understand the programming, it is to equip Nebraska seniors with the basic skills needed to function and flourish in an increasingly digital online world. And I operate on the principle that, hey, seniors, you never really had to know how the internal combustion engine worked in order to drive a car. You focused on the mobility that the car gave you. Consequently, with computers, with digital devices, with smartphones, stop f worrying about the how and instead function on the why, the utility that you're deriving, the benefits that accrue from using the technology. So we lay out the course content to be an introduction to devices, whether it be a laptop or personal computer, a tablet or a smartphone, the internet so that they can surf, an introduction to email so that they can have an email account which will support their ability to do online banking and online shopping, 
Then for their protection, we'll show them how they can order their credit report and enact a security freeze. That's as far as I want to take them. That's over three hour and 15 minute training sessions. I'd like to see these operated as labs where we provide the training and then sit down one on one or one to many and with devices in front of us, try all of these functions so that they can leave being fully functional on the basics of crossing the digital divide. And we'll conclude with a section on online safety and security for their benefit. This information and more is available on our consumer website, which is protectthegoodlife.nebraska.gov. The identity theft tile is prominent there in the middle. You can file a complaint at the button that's located there on the left middle. As always, I welcome direct contact. I'm available at the Capitol at 402-471-3878. As I said at the outset with my very bad joke, my door is always open. I encourage you to drop in, give me a call, or invite me out into your uh, senior center or agency, and we'll help the senior cross the di digital divide and stay protected until we meet again, hopefully next year. Very Thank good. you again for your time and Brian, attention. Thank you so much.